and welcome to Maastricht University Live, a master's edition, a live chat show for students who are looking for a master's program at Maastricht University. This edition, we're talking about all types of master programs, what you can do here in Maastricht, the housing situation, and much more. I'm your host, Steph Nagel, and I will be guiding a panel and asking your questions to this panel here. Furthermore, you can ask your questions in a live chat at this moment if you have any further questions about master programs. My panel here today exists out of three people. One will join in halfway through, <laughs> but let's first introduce, let them first introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Misha. I'm a, a master student from FHML, studying health food innovation management, and I'll be answering your, all your questions about master programs today. Hi, I am Grace Marshall. I'm the content editor for a foundation called My Maastricht Pintanel, uh, and we answer all of your questions about student life here in Maastricht. All right, thank you very much. We're going to take a bird's eye perspective today on master programs because Master University has 60 programs uh, and 10 study fields. So you, you're doing a master at the moment, and yeah. so am I, and you've, well, you're, you're last year a bachelor <laughs> yes. at least. So then a very good first question would be, how did you choose your master? Maybe, Misha, I'll start with you. Uh, for me, well, I started looking at masters halfway through my bachelor, so my second year. Uh, I did a Bachelor of Biomedical Sciences, really liked it, but I didn't feel like doing all the research the rest of my life. So I was looking at something that combined um, the biomedical biome field, so human biology, metabolism, organ systems, um, but also more to a business and more practical side of things. So I looked all throughout the Netherlands, even abroad, but abroad is very expensive. Um, <laughs> so as a student, you have to account that, of course. Um, looked at a lot of lot of different masters, and finally I found uh, a master here in Maastricht, where I also did my bachelor's. Was not planning on that, um, but yeah, it, it was the master of my choice. Uh, health food innovation management combined uh, the human biology aspect, metabolism, and business, which I really appreciate, and I'm really happy with my choice. Cool. So, uh, yeah. Nice. Grace, what are you going to do, actually? Because it's a bit unclear, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm also doing the Bachelor's in Biomedical Science. Um, and funnily enough, I also know that I don't want to do research. I prefer to do something a bit more uh, business-related. So uh, currently, with the whole Brexit situation, I'm definitely looking within the Netherlands, trying to stay here. Uh, but yeah, looking in Maastricht, I just got accepted to uh, a Master's in Healthcare Policy, Innovation and Management, which I'm really excited about. Um, and also a few options in Utrecht and Rotterdam. But cool. Yeah, there's lots of there's lots of choice out there. Hmm. I mean, for me, it was the same as for you guys. Like being a master from a bachelor it made sense, of course, to then just also well, kind of do a master here, and that's why I finally found public policy and human development at the Unimerit, and that was actually one and only choice. I never looked at anything else. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess that um, yeah, that's nice. That's a good start. So for the people watching at the moment. There is a panel of students taking your questions in the live stream. So we will answer some questions here live, but there will also be people answering in the chat themselves. So you, will, you can always ask your questions. Don't hesitate. We're now going to go to a small video uh, about all the 60 programs at Maastricht University, uh, which we will roll in a second, I suppose. And then we'll be right back with the next part. Decisions, decisions. How to choose a master's. What makes you happy? What makes you tick? What would you like to do for the rest of your natural life? Amen. These are fundamental questions, and they're the sort of questions you and other prospective master students may ask themselves before choosing a study programme. Yes, heavy stuff. To find an answer, you may first want to decide on the type of masters. Will it be a regular programme or a research programme? Regular programmes are taught and course-based. They basically follow the same format as your bachelor's. Research programmes are more independent. Of course, you'll receive support and supervision, and you'll collaborate with other students, but the pace and format of your studies will be determined by your research work. Are you ready for research? Or is a regular programme more suitable for your goals? Secondly, you may want to zoom in on the individual programmes on offer. Maastricht University has more than 60 master's programmes. To make the choice easier, some would say more difficult, Maastricht University has put all those programmes into 10 categories. Categories? Well, 
You could call them themes as well, or fields of study, or areas of interest. No, not the Ten Commandments, because it's all up to you. Let's check them out one by one, briefly, because we don't want to bamboozle you with science. First, if you're an art lover or a cultural person, you may want to explore the impact of authors and artists on society, or look at arts from a business perspective, or focus on issues such as technology. There are three master's programmes on offer in the arts and culture category. Behavioural Sciences has five programmes, ranging from forensic psychology to mental health and neuroscience. And if you find it hard to choose, you may opt for human decision science. Fascinated by the world of business and economics? You can choose from no fewer than 19 programmes, including auditing, econometrics and fiscal economics. Want to learn more about learning? Go for one of the two education programmes on offer. That will teach you a lesson. If you're a true citizen of the world, globalisation and development might be just your subject. There are four angles – health, development, law and sustainability. Health and Life Sciences has as many as 18 programmes for you, ranging from medicine to biomedical sciences and from neuroscience to human movement. We all know that studying law makes you one of the fortunate few. Ten programmes on offer here, some Dutch, some European, some international. So, what will be your verdict? Media technology and innovation comes in three flavours. Research, European studies on society, science and technology, and digital studies. Enter the world of power and decision-making with politics and governance. You can study and research developments from various perspectives. Political science, history, sociology, philosophy. There are eight programmes for you. Last but not least, sciences. The hardcore university stuff. With five programmes including systems biology, data science and artificial intelligence. As you will have noticed, there's quite some overlap, with some programmes falling neatly into more than one category. Don't let this confuse you. Just follow your heart and your vision of your future, and you'll get there. And we're back. For those people that are watching on YouTube at the moment, if you cannot text in the chat, refresh your page, uh, and you will be able to ask your questions then, just in case you have some issues there. So what we're going to do next, we're going to talk about making choices uh, in considering master programs, because there are many options to choose from. So you have like normal masters and research masters, now, Misha, I've heard that you've actually done uh, some research in this one, actually. So what's the difference between uh, a, a normal master and a research master? Yeah, um, in preparation to this uh, live stream, I looked, <laughs> looked up the difference uh, because I actually didn't know. Uh, apparently, a research master can be both master of arts and master of science. But re the difference is that the research master is often two years and you actually conduct a lot of research, as the name says. Um, so. Yeah, for, for some uh, reason, if you want to do, uh, for example, a PhD, it's more, uh, it's better to do a research master because then you're better prepared. Um, and yeah, you, you have, for example, in the biomedical uh, research master, you have a junior and a senior practical training. Mm. In total, almost nine to 12 months of purely research. So you, yeah, you really train to conduct research, design it, uh, write research proposals. <laughs> so that's a, the main difference what I got from sites like Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's some good sourcing right there. Right. Um, so that would also make it like the biggest difference, of course, between a bachelor and a master in general, right? Like the research you're doing is much more elaborate, I suppose. Yeah, I think uh, for the bachelor, it's mostly um, yeah, getting knowledge uh, and learning, studying how you get uh, resources and where you can find knowledge and during the master is more training your research skills especially indeed for a research master is, is training to become a researcher so considering that you had to look up what the difference is yeah. um, that's a good one uh, did you make a, an active you didn't make an active choice I suppose then between doing a master or a research master um, I did though um, because as I mentioned before I didn't want to do research for the rest of my life mm -hmm. so I do uh, at this moment do a master of science 
So there's still research involved. I still have to write the thesis. I have to do research internship. But it's not as focused on research as, for example, biomedical science hmm. does. So it, it was an active choice for me because I really wanted to do more uh, applied, uh, a, a more applied uh, yeah, masters, yeah. which I'm doing now. So it's more, you get law, you get business, you get uh, consumer behavior, stuff like that. Um, and during, for example, the biomedical sciences, you would mainly focus on doing research in biomedical sciences and preparing for a PhD. Because yeah. that's what most of the people there end up doing. So Grace, I mean, how did you arrive at your choices? I mean, yeah, I also didn't want to do a research master's. And I was also quite keen to do a master's that's only one year, because I really want to get out and get some uh, practical experience as soon as possible. So for me, uh, the main choice was on choosing a master's that was only one year instead of two. Um, and yeah, I think that master's that, uh, obviously you gain a lot of skills with the research um, and you get some really good opportunities there. But like masters that are only one year, that's often quite intense as well. And then you're going to still get similar skills through being in like a normal work environment. Um, so yeah, I'm also avoiding the research masters. It's like my personal preference. <laughs> I suppose, yeah. I mean, just as, as you two, I also didn't do a research master, so we don't have anyone here at the moment that could say, like, research master. But I suppose that there is actually people, I know a few people that actually do a research master and say, like, this is really what I wanted to do. I want to go into academia, and I really want to see the options that it offers in that direction. But yeah. I suppose if you want some more re real-life uh, experience later on, then maybe the research master is not the way to go. Then. Yeah. I mean, definitely, if you know that you want to do research, then there's so many options within Maastricht University for you to like, take more steps along that path. And especially if you want to do a PhD at the end of it, then yeah. you're being really well prepared for that, which is good. So in your bachelor programs, you developed the better with biomedical sciences. Did most students take the same choices as you did, or was it quite diverse in the end? Ours is currently quite diverse. I'm chatting to a lot of different, uh, a lot of my friends, a lot of different students. Uh, and our program is super international. So there's a lot of people going back home, staying in the Netherlands, going to other places in Europe. Um, and yeah, I have, I think it's 50-50 split on people who wanted to do research and who are going down like the research master route, um, or even people who are having a year out and doing like a research internship, or people who are yeah doing like masters like we wanted to do of, uh, that are a bit more like practical focused, I guess. But yeah, loads of different choices from what we did. Yeah, I think that accounts for me as well. I think most, though, from my year, ended up doing the research master of biomedical sciences. And some of my friends uh, are even doing a PhD right now. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think from biomedical sciences, four or five ended up doing the same master as I'm doing currently. And some went whole other ways, epidemiology, for example, is one that uh, some students picked, or even just uh, go into a whole other direction. Okay. Yeah. 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 For me, European studies coming from a more sociology mm -hmm. perspective. Mm. I mean, this is quite sciency. So <laughs> uh, that side, I think, in my program, there was so many choices as well. I mean, European studies itself is already a broad yeah. bachelor program. So you had people doing the, the research master, doing the normal master, and then you had like I think ten people from my study doing what I'm doing at the moment, the Unimerit, and then there's also people going abroad, going to Germany, going to Scandinavia, doing everything. So, I mean, it's it's very diverse. Yeah. But then there's a question. I mean, maybe you know more about. Maybe you've discussed <laughs> it as well. But like with your friends and parents, did you discuss the choices that you were gonna make? Like, how did you talk about it? Um, I talked about it with some friends, uh, get their insights. Some of my friends, I, I did two, uh, four years. Uh, it took me four years to finish my bachelor's. So I had the uh, advantage of people, friends of mine, already starting their masters mm -hmm. when I was still finishing up. So I could already get experience from them, what they liked. Um, yeah, and I talked, of, of course, I talked about it with my parents, but I think the main choice was my own. So I just looked at a lot of different options online, uh, visited a lot of open days. I think that's the best way to go, just try to get as many, uh, yeah, as, as much information as you can get, because then you also know what you don't want, yeah. which is something good, um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like, my parents are still kind of keen for me to come back to England. <laughs> so <laughs> I went to some master's days in London, uh, 
uh, in London and in Bath and places like this. And walking around England, I was like, this is lovely, but I want a more international environment than this. So for me, going to open days really showed me what I didn't want, which was going back to England. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like every single time I see a master's that I'm interested in, then I'm, I'm sending it to my parents or to my friends and I'll, uh, I'm very nerdy. I have a spreadsheet of like what I like about mm -hmm. them, what I don't. Um, so yeah, making my friends laugh was like, hey, yeah, so I really like this aspect of this new master's, but I think that the other ones mm -hmm. that I'm considering are maybe a bit more applicable. But yeah, like for me, it's just a whole constant conversation in my head of trying to like Weird figure out. What, yeah, 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 definitely. But it's really exciting to have all of these options and to have like five or six programs that I'm really interested in and to get to choose between them is, is tricky, but is kind of really nice as well to yeah. have that much availability. Yeah. So we got a question now from the chat and we want to put them on screen. Uh, Mike Myhel on Facebook asks, is it possible to pursue a master's in Maastricht while living in Brussels? You are going to spend so much time on the train, uh, the train <laughs> from Brussels to Liège and then Liège to Maastricht. But uh, I have uh, one or two friends who lived in Brussels and did their, did their bachelor program at least in Maastricht. Yeah. So definitely possible. I mean, um, maybe not compared to Brussels, um, but you know, people living in the north of the Netherlands coming mm. all the way with the train down south. I know a few people that are actually from um, Nijmegen, which is at least two hours away yeah. from here, or Den Bosch, which, which is one and a half hours away from here. So you comparable distances and they still do it. I think a master program really depends on um, the, the workload that you have, yeah. how much you do at university itself, and how much you spend time at home on, on it. Definitely. So, it's definitely possible. I think with this it would be important to mention that research masters often want you to be doing research. Uh, for biomed at least, they want you to be in the lab mm. nine to five most days of the week. Uh, and at that point, then that's quite tricky if you're having to make that journey every single day. Um, but there are masters I know that only want you in maybe three, two or three days a week and the rest of the time it's at home. So maybe if you're, if you're picking one that has fewer contact hours, then living in Brussels might be a bit easier. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Well, so I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, come like, to Maastricht if you yeah. can. I mean, <laughs> we're going to go into housing in a little bit, so yeah, it, yeah. it's going to be we're going to discuss housing and how <laughs> we're going to do that, but that's going to be later. Um, so for master programs as well, like I don't have the exact numbers, but you can have a feeling about it, right? Maybe, maybe this is not so much a question for you, but uh, Misha, how do you, how many people dropped out actually of your master? I think that's not a large number. I think for bachelor, that number will be much higher because people are yeah. still looking at what they want to do later in life. And people pick just a bachelor start and after one year, they're like, no, this is not for me. Um, but picking your masters, you have a lot more insight in what you want to do later in life. And you do a lot more research often. And I think for my master's, for example, there were two dropouts, one because she didn't like it and one due to personal reasons. So that number is quite low. And also for biomedical sciences, but even international business, that number is not that high in the master's. Yeah. People are really determined to finish it. They're, they want to do it. And for bachelor, it's often, I just want to be a student. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So mm, I mean, yeah, yeah. big difference. At least what I remember from, from high school is what they said, at least one third of the people will drop out of their bachelor. Mm. But that number for masters is much lower, I suppose, because you know, you're know you actually actively already going in the specific mm. specific specificity of a, of a program. Yeah. So. And you also feel that in the motivation of the students. Yeah. Like in the bachelors, a lot of people were just freestyling and <laughs> <laughs> not showing off for classes or not prepared. And for the masters, people really put in the effort because yeah. they want to, they just want to finish it and they want to learn a lot. So is it, uh, is biomedical side or like the, sorry, the master that you're doing, is it also uh, very international or more clustered? In the yeah, region? no, I think my health, health food innovation management, about one third is international. So oh, wow. uh, in my year, it's currently 36 people. And I would say 24 are Dutch, and the rest is spread all over the world. So people from Spain, Italy, England, but also China. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's quite international. I really like that. I really appreciate that. Also, about other master programs in Maastricht, it's really international. You feel the culture of other people. You get to talk with them, get whole different insights. Because, let's be honest, we all live in our own bubbles yeah. Mm. Yeah. and um, 
and you're really convinced of that your bubble is the right one and that your insights are correct and that you have all the knowledge. But no, it's really interesting to talk to international people, get their opinions and views on, on stuff. And um, yeah, that, that's something I really appreciate in this master, the international aspect. I mean, not to brag though, but my master is the most international one in my <laughs> So, uh, uh, so I, but I, I, shared a, I, I share the feelings with you. Like it's, it's, it's that nice feeling of, of meeting new yeah. cultures and talking to that. So yeah, but um, yeah, yeah, it's fun. So do you think that a master is, or do you think that your master maybe, is more difficult than the bachelor that you did? Definitely, definitely. Um, to be honest, yeah, the bachelor, it was, it was not all fun, but it was a lot easier than the master. On average, I think during the bachelor I spent maybe at home 10, 12 hours studying, max. Um, that's apart that's a lot ap less than what they recommend. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's apart from the uh, contact hours, yeah, yeah obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... I think in total I would spend maybe 20, 25 if the topic was a bit harder. But during the master, yeah, it goes above 30 because you have to study so much at home, especially for um, my, my master's quite broad. So I have uh, courses like law, which I've never done before, mm. uh, food law to be uh, specific. And we had to read like 150 pages each week before each tutorial. We had to summarize those. We had to apply it to a case. I spent I've spent so many hours in the lab in the library, which I hadn't done before. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, not not that many at least. So I was in the library for like twenty hours a week, which was new for me. <laughs> uh, so in the beginning, that was quite Reading tough. New spaces in Moscow. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> so and I had to adapt to that a bit, but. They were all fun. I liked all the courses, which makes it easier to, to invest that amount of time. But yeah, to, to summarize, it's a lot harder. You have to put in more effort. The topics are more difficult. The amount of time you have to invest is higher. But yeah. in the end, for me, it's worth it. Uh, you, get, you also get the results. It's not... Um, yeah, it's not... Uh, if, you, if you put in a lot of hours you get the results. Yeah. I'm very impressed you could get through the Biomed Bachelor with only 12 hours of study a week. <laughs> I, I, had the, I have to, I have to be <laughs> honest, I did the old curriculum. I yeah, uh, finished my okay. bachelor's, I think, two and a half years ago. Okay. So that was the old curriculum. That was not the international one okay. you're doing yeah. right now. <laughs> and I was going to say, God, 12 hours is no, not... No, what I've heard is a bit more <laughs> easy uh, than what it is now. So, yeah. I was suddenly judging myself as a student. No, no, no. It's, it's like, not that you I'm can like do it on 12 <laughs> hours? Oh my God, this boy's a genius. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. No, to be honest, it was a lot. I mean, also my friends from The Bachelors, they didn't put in the hours as well. I mean, everyone advertises I mean, 40. I guess that we, we shouldn't uh, brag about the no, no, uh, hours <laughs> we put in there. So for those people that are just joining in now, actually, we're wa you're watching Master University Live, a master's edition, uh, a live chat show for students that are considering a master's program at Master University. In this edition, we've been talking about making choices for a master's program uh, and student life in general in a little bit. But now, because that's quite similar for both bachelors and masters, is the PBL system, problem-based learning. Now, I don't have to explain it to you guys, but I may have to explain it to the, to the chat. Problem-based learning, for those that don't know, is a system where you don't sit into, in lecture halls with 300 people, but you sit in small groups of 15 people, where you discuss a topic on hand with readings and uh, debates that are very current at the moment, which is a lot more active, an active way of, of studying than... Um, than, than a regular lecture hall sitting every single day just going there and listening. So the participation is a lot different. Maybe uh, because this is a question we can all answer, right? Like, how do, how do you guys experience this? Like, what, what is your experience with PBL? <laughs> I love it. Honestly, it's one of my favorite parts about studying here. Like, uh, the Biomed Bachelor in first year was massive. We had almost 400 students. And yet I still feel as though I know, like, 200 people by name because I was in a tutorial group with them. And you're in this small little group and you really feel as though you have interaction with like everyone in your study. Uh, some of my closest friends now are people that I met in tutorials um, that I still am like, I'm really, really close with two years after like we had a group together. Um, I think it's really good. I think it teaches you to be very independent and to be very active and like switched on when you're learning something, especially when I chat to students, um, to friends back at home in England who are students in, in England. 
Uh, and they're like, yeah, I guess I don't really know that many people in my study because all I do is sit in a lecture hall and you watch the, the professor go through stuff and you take notes and then you leave. And for me, like learning the, the like, topics that we had was always so active and you were really being encouraged and like you were being questioned and said, uh, being asked, like, do you actually really know this? Can you prove to yourself that you know this? And I loved it. I really worked well within that. I thought it was so cool to be like uh, in a group that was all really enthusiastic about actually learning and actually like pushing the boundaries of what you could find out. Yeah, Misha, do you experience the same? I, I totally can confirm that. Um, for me, that works as well. Like if I can explain something to someone else in a tutorial, because that's what you're constantly doing, you're uh, debating and you're discussing stuff. And if I can explain for example, a mechanism or pathway to someone else, then I really know, okay, I got this. I, I know what it means. I know how it works. And yeah, for me, the, the problem-based learning system, I really appreciate it as well. It works for me. I don't, I'm not the guy that sits in the lecture hall mm. the entire day. I fall asleep. I find that like, so hard. Yeah. Pe people actually, yeah, I, I just fall asleep in the lecture after one hour. Um, so for me, PBL works, uh, discussing it, explaining to others. Yeah. And and also what you say about getting to know other people, yeah, that's that's something I really appreciate as well, especially for my masters. Uh, during um, biomedical science, I already had like a group of friends, um, but during the masters, it really helps you to get your place. Um, yeah, s especially since the masters, a lot of new people come in, international yeah. people who don't yeah. know anyone. But that's also an interesting question. Like, is it easy for those people that just come in without knowledge of PBL mm -hmm. from their bachelor to actually join in in that system? Yeah, do you, definitely. Do you think it works? Yeah, if, if I can say from my master, yeah, it does work. Uh, the first two, three weeks, the people who are new with the system are a bit more shy yeah, and they're yeah. laid back <laughs> and they're uh, just waiting their turn. But after two, three weeks, they, they get out of their comfort zone and they start uh, yeah. involve their self in the and discussion. I've had friends who were like, oh, I was really worried that I'd be maybe like too shy or too introverted for this. And actually, I think you end up in such a nice group and like, you know what questions are going to be asked. You know what you had to study. You're not there being asked things that you have no idea about. And like, if you are, then you maybe should have studied a little bit more. <laughs> you should have read more, yeah. <laughs> so at that point, then, even if you are a little bit shy, you're really knowledgeable about this topic. You always have things to contribute, like everyone does. And so then it really helped uh, draw out people who were like kind of uh, in, in their shell a yeah. little bit, helped them like be a bit more confident and then yeah. make friends really easily because then you're like, you know, it's essentially a two hour discussion that you have every single week. So yeah, yeah. You know, a nice times a week, Yeah, multiple times well. a week, yeah. yeah. But then, so how much time do you spend preparing? Yeah, you said 12 hours a week. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Not for my masters, oh, no, okay. let's cut that. <laughs> <laughs> but like how much t time do you st study for, for preparing for tutorials? Like, is there um, an approach that you take? Yeah, I think the first one or two hours is mainly looking up literature. So mm -hmm. getting the right uh, papers and uh, watching some YouTube videos, uh, going to the library, find books, and then it's maybe five, six hours on going through this literature, summarizing it, and then I think the last hour is just connecting it to the case, applying it. So you get uh, each case in a tutorial, you get a couple of sub questions that mm. you have to answer, which lead the discussion. And then during these, uh, and when I'm studying, then I link the uh, literature to these questions so that I have the right order for the post discussion during yeah, the tutorial. Exactly. So I would say each tutorial between six and 10 hours per tutorial. And then sometimes after the tutorial, you have to do some stuff as well because you missed out on a certain topic or uh, you didn't find the right literature and then like oh I should look that up and then yeah I mean the good part is I mean we're talking about 150 pages a week it's sometimes, yeah. sometimes you have that right so it's also great that PBL gives you the the option to make well, it's not maybe recommended but like you could say I read four sources you read four sources we summarize them both and we discuss them in class and this this mutual understanding of knowledge is actually still very helpful for the entire understanding I would say True. so um, yeah that's that's interesting about PBL. Um, before we're going into a video of the PBL, if you still have any <laughs> doubts about it, 
do not hesitate to ask questions in the chats because we will answer your questions here or either in the chat itself. So let's cue the PBL video, I suppose. Maastricht University uses the problem-based learning teaching method, which is interactive, self-directed, engaging and relevant. I'll now explain you how PBL works. PBL uses a case-by-case -case scenario. At the beginning of your course, you get a course book where all your cases are listed. Take, for example, case one. Your first case is going to be a page, a page and a half of information, which you read as a group. The first thing you do is to make sure that everybody in the group understands all the information given. Do you understand every word? Does your neighbor understand every word in it? After that, you're holding a brainstorm. What do we already know? What information is written in this case? Which problems are written down? After you have done that and you've finished your brainstorm, you cluster these together. Problem one, problem two, problem three, what are the issues that are coming up? After you have clustered this, you make learning goals. Learning goals are basically just the questions, but these questions come from the group. So you and your peers are responsible for analyzing the text and thus creating the questions that need to be answered. You're also gonna have mandatory readings. However, because you as a group set forward the questions that need to be answered, there's a good chance that some of your questions are not in the mandatory readings. For this, for three years straight, you also have to conduct your own research. After you've done your self-study, you come back to the class and you start answering the questions. What do we know? What is my answer? What is your answer? And because you have created, uh, you have done your own research, you're also responsible for debating here. I have answer A to a question. My neighbor has answer B. Who is right? Who is wrong? Did I make a mistake? Did she make a mistake? Due to this interactiveness of the material and due to the debating, you're far more interactive with all the materials. There's a tutor there who makes sure that you're staying on the right track, that the right questions are being asked and that you're not spending too much time on the wrong thing. Maastricht University uses the problem-based learning teaching method, if you're which is new interactive, here, you just join in. This is Maastricht University Live, a master's edition, a live chat relevant. show for students who are considering a master's program at Maastricht University. In the second half of this program, we're going to discuss housing, uh, social life, and scholarships with our new guest here, <laughs> who just arrived. Could you introduce yourself? Yes, I'm uh, Josine. I'm from the scholarship office of Maastricht University. And uh, yeah, we offer a large variety of scholarships uh, for a large demographic, but they're all um, spe specifically tailored to either studies or nationalities. So there are quite a lot of different types that people might be interested in. So uh, I'm here to elaborate mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, money is always an issue, right? For everyone involved, either you get it through your parents or you get it through the state, but there's always a thing. So scholarships, are of course a way of, of getting money to fund yourself. But could you explain a little bit how that works, uh, yeah. the system? Yeah, the main advice I can give is start in time. We would also, uh, we open all the scholarship applications uh, in October already of uh, before the next academic year. So for now, some scholarships are open for the start of September 2020. And for the start of September 2021, it will open next October. So start on time. And uh, don't be shy, because people sometimes think they have to be um, accepted into a master before applying for a scholarship. Hmm. Of course, one of the factors of gaining a scholarship is to be accepted into the master, but you don't need to do it in that specific order. So apply for the scholarship even if you're not accepted yet, and then once you get accepted, we will match your scholarship application with your acceptance ap application, and then you are in. But yeah. there is one drawback, um, it's quite competitive and that's everywhere and that's also at Maastricht University unfortunately. So um, do your very very best because the acceptance rate of a scholarship with us is about 3%. So you can imagine that it's quite quite small number of people who get a, a scholarship. So in that case, yeah, do the best you can. So someone's asking in the chat, um, can I apply for a UM Holland High Potential Scholarship in 21, 2021, even if I get into a master's program in 2020? Yes and no, it depends. A master program in 2020, if it's a two-year program and you enroll in 2020 and start your master in 2020, then you cannot apply for the UM Holland High Potential uh, Scholarship for 2021 just because we do not allow uh, current students to get the UM Holland High Potential Scholarship. 
So, so could you maybe, because I, I don't know what a high potential scholarship is, could you maybe explain it for me? Yes, <laughs> that's our very unique scholarship. That's the one that University Maastricht offers themselves. And um, it is a scholarship that covers everything when you come in here. So it covers tuition fees, living expenses, your visa application, uh, housing. Uh, it's all included in the scholarship. So that's actually one where you can study here for free. It's one of the yeah. few ones that actually allow you to do so. So uh, that's a quite important one. Hmm. Um, is that but so is that the three percent that yeah. gets that? Yeah. And there's no other scholarships beside that? There are many other scholarships. Some are uh, national, so mm -hmm. provided by Dutch government, and some of them are provided by us. Uh, we, for example, offer a University of Maastricht scholarship for refugees living in Belgium and Germany. And there are some national uh, scholarships like the Orange Knowledge Program, the Orange Tulip Scholarship, uh, and, and Future Matters. There are a few. I would also say, always say search for scholarships on our website. You then get the full list of all scholarships we offer. It's most clear because there are so many differences in eligibility that it's quite hard to explain. Yeah. Yeah. So, Betisaida on YouTube asks, is there any external financial aid for African students, specifically? I suppose you can also find it there then? or Yeah, definitely. Uh, financial aid uh, and scholarships are two separate things. Financial aid is normally uh, a loan. Uh, the scholarship, uh, for a loan we don't have anything for African students, but we do offer scholarships for African students. Specifically, the Orange Knowledge Program, uh, that one is uh, available specifically for uh, students from African countries. So uh, the deadline is the 1st of April. So if you want to enroll <laughs> for uh, that scholarship uh, for t September 2020, then apply now, I'd say. Is uh, a scholarship, is that for a one year period or is it for the whole duration of your stay? The scholarships we offer are mostly for a whole duration of the stay. Okay. If it's not, then it's indicated on the website. But generally, it's for the whole duration of your stay. So, so we've discussed, like in the first half, about research masters and normal masters. Right. And the research masters are most of the time two years. Right. Um, so you would be compensated for two years, basically. Absolutely, yes. And there is one small part of it mm -hmm. that you have to do well. Okay. Because it's mostly if you don't do well and you're here to party instead of study, <laughs> then uh, you will not be granted the second year of the scholarship. So it is based mm -hmm. on getting your ECTS in during your uh, study. So, okay, that's actually quite interesting. So uh, is it the grades that matter or is it just uh, the, the, the getting the points? Or the, uh, the, the ECTS yeah, exactly. is what yeah, matters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and okay. you don't have to do the full part for every scholarship. You don't have to get the full 60 ECTS for a year for every scholarship. But there is some degree where we have to cut off. Hmm. So, for example, if you only uh, get one course and you have only a 10 ECTS, then I'm sorry, the second year will be lost. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that, that's very fair. Yeah. Um, so, let's see, is, uh, that's actually a good question. Can I get two scholarships at the same time? Um, well, you can apply for two scholarships at the same time, that's no problem. You can apply for ten scholarships at the same time, but most scholarships only uh, allow people to get a scholarship if, uh, if, they, uh, if they only accept that one. So uh, it would mean that if you apply for several scholarships and you get awarded multiple scholarships, you have to select one okay. of them, and that one you have to accept, and the other ones you have to reject. Okay, hmm. but then so I've never thought of a scholarship, so that's yeah. just that's why I'm a little bit in the in the blind here. Right. Um, what are the requirements for for getting a scholarship then? Like. It's high grades, just that? Some of them, it depends per scholarship. The Holland High Potential, it's indicated in the title, it's the Holland High Potential. So you need to have high grades and we're looking for the best students all of the, uh, out all of the world to come to Maastricht. Um, there are some other scholarships, like the Orange Knowledge Program is based on uh, your civil position within your own country. Mm -hmm. So they're looking more about how your civil society, how you uh, help in there more than grades. So it depends per scholarship what is most important. Yeah. So maybe asking the other people on the panel here, like, have you ever thought of doing a scholarship or no, actually, or getting into it? <laughs> yeah, no, actually not. And maybe I've wasted some money. I've, I missed out <laughs> on some money because some people in my uh, master's degree actually uh, got a scholarship. And so I only <laughs> learned about scholarships when it was too late for me to apply. So that's a bit of a shame. 
Um, but yeah, no, I've, I've never thought about it before. Hmm. So. I thought about it when I was applying to universities back in England because it's so much more expensive yeah. there. Um, but no, this is only 20% of the cost back in England, so I was like, oh, okay, I won't even look. Mm. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's always good to research, because yeah. it, some people think that the scholarships are only available for certain nationalities, but actually there are so many different types that for almost every nationality there is a scholarship available. Just start in time, because some of the deadlines have already passed in February, and that's quite difficult if you want to start in September to already apply, know what you want to do, then apply for the master and for the scholarship before February. Yeah. So uh, we ask quite a lot, so keep that in mind. If you want to come to us in September 2021, then uh, make sure to already start researching later this year and uh, immediately apply when uh, it opens in October 2020. Yeah. So, okay, that's cool. But then what are the do's and don'ts of, of applying for a scholarship? Right. The <laughs> do's are to read carefully mm -hmm. because we ask something of students to, who apply for a scholarship. We want, the, for example, do you own high potential? We want the high potential students. Makes sense. Um, we then require people to follow a few steps in the procedure. Not only apply for the master, but also provide us with a motivation letter, a recommendation letter, all these types of documents. Um, we do that to also assess if people are uh, willing and uh, are able to do so. So um, if you are not following these steps correctly, automatically you're out. Oh, yeah. And then you think you have applied because you did kind of the basics, mm -hmm. but you haven't done it properly or not through the right channels, and then you're out. So read carefully. That's the basic, basic do and, and the best advice I can give that you have to read carefully. And yeah. So an, an absolute don't, maybe just one? <laughs> an absolute don't. Um, well, there is not really, because you can always contact us through our scholarships email address. Mm -hmm. We're there to answer any questions. It doesn't matter what it's, what it's regarding, if it's very specific or not. Mm -hmm. So if you have a question, do that. So don't, in that case, wait <laughs> till the last minute, because I can tell you in uh, the end of January, we really are full with emails and we cannot uh, reply to them all before the 1st of February, which is an important deadline. Mm -hmm. So be on time. So uh, don't wait till the last minute and uh, see on the 31st of January what you have to do to get an application in before the 1st of February. Because if any questions arise, we cannot help you anymore because yeah. we are so fully booked. We have so much to do that we can't <laughs> answer them all in time, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. No um, problem at all. That's uh, that's actually, I suppose, enough about scholarships. I mean, we can talk about this for hours, I suppose, but <laughs> yeah. then maybe just email you and then they can find out more. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so for those people that are watching now, don't hesitate to ask questions because we will answer them and we find them, we can see them right here uh, and we will try to answer them with the panel that we have at the moment. So let's go a little bit into housing and that's why Grace is also here <laughs> because you're from my mymaastricht.nl or .com? Yes, .nl. .nl. Yeah. Um, so how is the housing situation in Maastricht? Let's just jump into it. <laughs> oh, so the housing situation in Maastricht can be a little bit tricky. Uh, I think we find a lot of students have the most trouble if they only start looking for housing in July and August. Uh, at the beginning of each academic year, there is a big introduction slash party week called the Incom. And we've had students arrive in Incom trying to find a house then. And it's like, I'm really sorry, but no, this is a week before classes start. This is really, really late. Uh, honestly, most people, like, people will say that there can be a bit of an issue, that there's, like, issues with housing in Maastricht, but if people apply, start looking early enough, early enough being April or May, if they arrive with a realistic budget, which is, you know, uh, at least 350 euros, that is your bare minimum, mm -hmm. uh, and even then that is going to be a very small room on the outside of town that probably won't have much with it, uh, but yeah, a, a realistic budget, we, we help you say, like, 400 450 euros, uh, then yeah, then there are usually enough places and if you are prepared and you start looking early enough, you can expect to find a house. But yeah. But that's like, that's that's you talking from my master group now. How, how, <laughs> how, did you, how did you find your own room? Like through that website? How did website, I find actually? my own room? Uh, no, so I, when I first arrived here in first year, I lived up at the UM guest house. Um, not actually quite at the guest house, at uh, SSH housing, short stay housing. Um, because I was like, oh, I want to live with people, it'll be fun, I can meet people, and I ended up on a corridor with 20 people. 
I did meet people. Uh, some of the people that I lived with are still some of my closest friends today. Um, the kitchen was shared with 20 people and it did become a biohazard. Like <laughs> hazmat suits, everything, really disgusting. Uh, so yeah, you know, depending on your how much of a neat freak you are, maybe that's a good idea or maybe not. Um, and then where I live now, I found through the website Maastricht Housing, which is the official student portal for all housing in Maastricht. Um, on there you have housing offered by private landlords um, and you have housing offered by the corporations. So you have three social housing corporations in Maastricht. They are uh, Masvalai, uh, Svatius and Vonpunt. Mm -hmm. And with them, they offer very nice student housing. You often get subsidies with it. It's lovely. But uh, yeah, they do that based on a queue system so that it's fair. So you need to sign up for Maastricht housing, cost 35 euro for an account. But that's only a one-time fee. Um, and then the longer that you've been on the queue, the more likely you are to be able to get one of these really nice social corporation rooms. Um, but yeah, and they are often quite cheap and with subsidies even cheaper. But private landlords, they just pick the person that they like the best and then there is no queue for that. So yeah. Um, actually, that's an interesting point. So when we talked about scholarships and especially the one that pays for most of it, yeah. uh, the housing was included, but then you still have to look for your own housing then? Right, okay. yeah. But we cover the application fee for Maastricht mm. housing, <laughs> so they don't have to pay that. Uh, so that makes the border a little bit lower and uh, we can float a down payment, which is best for them because normally you have to pay like two months when you yeah. start living somewhere to have some kind of security deposit for the, for yeah. the uh, landlord. And we float that as well. So you don't have to pay two months at one time immediately. And then you have to pay your own rent, but we will give you the money to pay the rent. Okay, so uh, yeah. that's good to know. So yeah, I mean, obviously there are costs. We have a whole section on our website for like the costs of moving it, moving in from deposits to trying to get like uh, a lorry to help you move your stuff around the city. Um, there are really strict rules in, uh, in the Netherlands to help renters. So you can't be charged admin like excessive administration fees. You can't be charged fees for picking up your keys. Uh, and like coming okay. from London, this is so much better of a situation than in London because, you know, where I'm from, they can charge you 200 euros just to be given your keys. And that's completely <laughs> illegal here. Uh, so yeah, it's good. Like. Um, it can be tricky to find housing, but there is a lot of security around it. Obviously, be careful. We recommend Maastricht housing because it's the official portal. Uh, but there are options like uh, Pararius, uh, Zio housing, SSH, um, that will give you like non-official options. But yeah. So Misha, how did you find your uh, your room? Also Maastricht housing. Okay. Uh, and uh, so far, I've changed rooms every two years. Really? Uh, yeah. Uh, upgraded because it was longer on the list. So then you can uh, apply. Well, you can always apply for every room, but your chances of actually getting the room are higher. So after two years, uh, I applied for. Well, in the, in the beginning, I just had a regular student house uh, with shared kitchen and everything. And after two years, I was kind of done with that. Some nice <laughs> people I knew from the beginning moved out. So I was left with people who, well, left the kitchen a mess <laughs> most of the times and I had to clean for 30 minutes before I could even cook. So after two years, I was kind of done with that. So I looked for a place with my own kitchen. Uh, so I upgraded to that. And just three months ago, I moved to a place with my own kitchen and my own bathroom and a balcony even. Wow. Yeah, lucky, living, living the good life. <laughs> no, I, was, I was really lucky. I was um, on the list for four years on yeah. Maastricht Housing. And there were 73 people who applied, and I was on the first number one. Yeah. Uh, so I immediately when I walked in, I already know, okay, this is, this is what I'm going <laughs> to do. I, uh, <laughs> and I think the first thing I did when I stepped out of the building, I uh, accepted the room. Um, so yeah, I used Maastricht Housing as well, and I can confirm it's very nice. It's very, uh, the oversight is very nice. Uh, you have all these different uh, providers. Uh, I actually uh, was rented from all three of the social corporations. Oh, really? <laughs> Started with Mass for Light, like then Wonpunt. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, no, I, I started with Mass for Light, then Wonpunt, and now I'm at Sovatius. I can say all three are, are nice. There's, uh, yeah, they, yeah. And it, it, it's the nice thing about renting from a corporation is that everything is fixed for you. Yeah, mm. definitely. So, a uh, question from YouTube, it's now on screen. Uh, should I apply for housing before I get accepted to the UM? Uh, I think I can actually answer this one best for, for, because <laughs> when I when I came here for my bachelor, I I was you know still doing my studies, my high school. I was finishing it up, and I didn't even know I was going to pass my final exams. But I went to Maastricht because I knew I was going to study there. And in February, I was looking for a room, Maastricht as well. Yeah. 
I got one and I started renting it immediately. Didn't matter if I was gonna gonna pass my exams, but just like if I get this room and I can at least make sure that I have something somewhere to stay yeah. all the time. That was at least my strategy. So I definitely recommend yeah. if you know you want to go to Maastricht already in January, get it look for rooms. Look for rooms. It's and just yes. Yeah. And also for the corporations, you can uh, cancel your um, or well uh, yeah quit your your rent every month. So that's. It depends. Okay, yeah. For me, that was every okay. month I could, I could okay. just quit renting. Yeah. For me, it was also that it was a year-long contract, okay. so that was kind of like a high-risk move. But you know, it pays off in the end. If you if you know you're gonna go to Maastricht and you're gonna work for it, then it should not be an issue, I suppose. Yeah, we also have uh, some issues with students only getting accepted to the uni. In I mean, you can be accepted as late as the thirty-first of August. Mm -hmm. If you really, really want to come here and you really are a keen, then yeah, accept a room. Uh, accept a room, like maybe there is a deposit attached to this, but worst case scenario, you cancel the room, you get your deposit back, and you know that someone will immediately take up the offer because, like, there are always people who apply too late. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, maybe you know more about also we have housing as a cost. What are the monthly living expenses? <laughs> Uh, so we always, we do a lot of intro presentations, maybe if anyone came to the open days they would have seen us. Uh, in these presentations we always say that a reasonable budget is around 300 euros a month, this isn't including rent. Uh, and so yeah, this will be covering groceries, uh, beer, maybe going out like to the cinema, going on trips, maybe a little bit more beer. Um, I know what people are spending on it, so okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> let's not beat around the bush. <laughs> um, so yeah, we always say that this is quite a reasonable budget. You can, you know, uh, buy a bottle of wine if you're going to your friends for dinner. You can go to the cinema, but you go on the student nights, you know. Um, you can maybe take a trip, but you're going on a Flix bus and you're not flying first class or whatever. Uh, but yeah, most students work on around 300 euros a month. I have friends who work on a lot less. I have friends who work on like 250 euros. Um, but she does law and she's often having to buy quite expensive books for every mm. course that they do. And when they have to buy books, then they like she's then texting her parents saying, yeah, I need to buy another 50 euro book and this doesn't come out of my budget. So yeah, it like it's very dependent. I'd get in touch with people from the master's program that you're doing and seeing if there are like these associated costs like books and stuff. Um, but yeah, 300 euros should be should be reasonable for most students. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. feeling in the same ballpark, basically. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, obviously, if you want a bit more money, you can get another, you can get a job, like, super easy to get a student job in Maastricht. Uh, every single restaurant that I've ever walked past is looking for a dishwasher. Mm -hmm. So if you're willing to do the kind of mucky jobs, then, <laughs> then you'll definitely get paid for it. But, so yeah. on the topic of restaurants, then, like, are there any places that you is, is Maastricht known for its for its life or for its bar yeah life definitely there's like a massive student life here there's so many like student associations there's so many sports clubs and there's a really big uh yeah there's loads of bars and restaurants to go to and really nice student places as well like Maastricht uh, my Maastricht has a blog and there we recommend student friendly businesses so I know that just down the road where I'm going for lunch after this is like, <laughs> the nicest Korean restaurant in the city. And they do uh, a five euro fifty lunch deal, which has like pork bao buns and everything. So I did not I'm really know about looking this. forward to this. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> we're, going, we're going after it. <laughs> I'll join. I'll join. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so many different options. Cafes as well. There's 100 cafes in the city. And uh, when you when you finally do like twenty hours of studying, then you learn that yeah. where the really nice cafes are, where you need to go and study. So yeah. I mean, are there uh, because I only know one, and I don't think they still do that. But like a tea zone was the only one where you could study and uh, have a coffee or a tea, right? Or oh my god, no, there's loads. Like Alley Cat, uh, okay, Alley Cat's really popular. Um, uh, oh no, the the place is closed. But like, um, uh, there's another cafe called Oila, which is really really nice. Half of them you can go and sit down and chill. I've even studied in Fab, which is like the American oh, yeah. bistro. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm sitting there with like my barbecue wings studying. <laughs> I don't know, I was feeling it. It was great. But yeah. Okay, the options are, are there. <laughs> There's, There's lots, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I suppose then, you know, we've, we've touched upon eating and going out for drinks, but. Um, there's also, of course, lots of other stuff to do, right, in Maastricht. I mean, there's events going on. We just had Carnival, which is like the thing. If you, Madness, if you, yeah. <laughs> if you want to experience it. I don't know, maybe maybe you can talk about it. because uh, so, Carnival? Well, yeah, well, no. I mean, we both do Carnival, but yeah. like people from the Master that just came here for a year. Like, yeah. how do they experience that? 
I think very well. I, uh, are we talking about carnival specific or just Maastricht uh, in general? No, no, carnivals. Maybe carnival. that's an interesting one. It's it's a very interesting experience for them. Uh, in the beginning, they're really uh, surprised by what it is. They're confused. a bit overwhelmed, <laughs> confused. What are these people doing? Um, but I think after one or two days, because it's for in some places like a five day yeah, event. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, after one or two days, they're really enjoying it um, because it's just a place you, you can just go crazy, dress up in the weirdest possible way as you like, uh, sh make Feathers, up your yeah, glitter, all, it's, all of it. I mean, it's, it starts in November, right? Like that's yeah. when yeah. you open the season, <laughs> and that's when you have to realize if you're going to study here. Of course, just like in, the 11th of November, you yeah. know that the carnival is starting to yeah. to get going. <laughs> And other things to do. I mean, in summer, there's also lots, lots of there's stuff. There's so much to do. Yeah, there's, lots. There's this amazing bike ride you can do all the way down along the river. You can even bike to uh, a French-speaking area. Like, you can bike all the way down to Wallonia, which I always think is cool. Uh, there's the mountain. Mountain. We call it a mountain. It's, it's our mountain. mountain. Oh, don't touch our mountain. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a Dutch mountain. <laughs> it's like a small hill. But yeah. It's 312 meters. Okay. <laughs> it's the fast way. But like that's super popular in the summer. There's like this big plateau on top and everyone is up there watching the sunrise go down. Um, and yeah, the whole city in summer just spills out onto the streets and you have like, it's so nice to sit out on a terrace or sit out in the cafe. Uh, and yeah, half the summer is spent sitting outside with a glass of wine in your hands, which is lovely. In the city park. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so the park as well. So we just got a question still uh, on the screen at the moment. Uh, are there any reliable housing agencies in Maastricht? Uh, we've covered this a little bit a while ago, but maybe we can just say it again. Yeah, uh, obviously we would really recommend first looking at Maastricht Housing, um, which is like the official portal for student housing in, the, uh, in Maastricht at least. Um, if you're struggling with that, then I'd recommend looking at Pararius next. Um, make sure that in the description of the house that you're looking at, it says that it's a student house. Um, normal budget, as we said, is between 350 to 450 euros. Uh, anything 500 euros and more, then you're looking at uh, maybe your own studio or something like that, but a very small one. Um, housing agencies, we tend not to recommend specific agencies. If you want, like, you have housing agencies that just do student housing, like Zior Housing uh, and SSH, but they are just for students. There's also other ones. If you get in contact with us via our social media, then we will uh, look at what your specific requirements are and then maybe point you in the direction. Or the Facebook group. Yeah, yeah, the Facebook group, yeah. I mean, obviously, if you're looking at something on Facebook, then be careful, don't send money to like Western Union banks and stuff. <laughs> this is just a life advice, I guess. Um, but yeah, like Facebook, the page uh, Rooms Kama Zimmer in Maastricht, that's the really big one. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, thank you very much. I feel like we've exhausted, well, we've talked about a lot of things and I think we want to go for lunch in a bit as well. So this leads me to do a, a little bit of a wrap up. What we've talked about in the last hour was the programs that there are in Maastricht, the experiences of choosing a program, going for how, uh, looking for housing, the potential of doing, uh, getting a scholarship and all the options that are there, um, which has been, we've talked about a lot of things and it seems that the, the conclusions must be that there is a lot to do in Maastricht and the programs <laughs> are on offer are great. Problem-based learning is a very special thing that you can find here and you should consider as a speci speciality of this place. Uh, which leads me to thank my panel, actually. Thank you, Josine, for, for joining about the scholarships. Yeah. Grace, thank you from my Maastricht.nl and for joining me as a panel member. And Misha, thank you as well Welcome. for giving your experiences as a master student. <laughs> if there are any further questions, do not hesitate to answer the, to ask them via email at studio, st study at maastrichtuniversity.nl. Um, there will also be a, um, um, there will, we can also answer them on Facebook and we will gladly answer them everywhere we can. Can I also add that my Maastricht is doing another live stream in a month or two uh, that is specifically for new students arriving in Maastricht and we cover everything you need to know from finances to transport to more information about housing. So if you have any questions, you could also watch that too. And then that leaves me with two more announcements to make, which is basically that tomorrow we will have a very special and needed uh, live stream about the coronavirus, which I will also be hosting. So tune in for that if you have more questions about that. And then there's one more thing as well, which is that in April, we'll have a Dutch live stream, which I will also be hosting uh, for people from the HBO, from HBO coming here for a master's program. That will only be in Dutch, so people that are coming from other countries, unfortunately, this will not be for you, but that is also coming and in the pipeline. But tomorrow, tune in for, a corona, for the coronavirus livestream if you have any questions about that. We will be answering them. 
which leads me to thank you and wish you a happy and fine afternoon. Goodbye. <laughs>